Hello, Jimmy here. Uh, you find me in a graveyard. Uh, actually, no, you technically you find me in a cemetery. I am in Holy Cross Cemetery uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. And I'm going to put my gloves on because it is about a degree above freezing at the minute. So it's nippy here. Uh, it's a beautiful cemetery. Unfortunately, it's got things like this that sort of spoil the horizon line from any angle, in any direction. So I, I tried to find the nicest angle possible. So I could have angled it slightly over that way, but then I wouldn't have anywhere to sit because I'm on a bench, so deal with it. Uh, there will be some background noise. I apologize for that. There's building work and traffic, and it's very difficult to find a quiet spot in a city like this, but there we go. I've tried my best. And um, I was gonna be at Camp Hill Cemetery, but their leaf blower is on, and it is the single loudest thing I've ever heard. Anyway, economy, Cymru. Yn yr oes mynd i afol. A ni. So, I did a little poll on my community page and asked people what they would like to see and the majority of people went for the economy of medieval Wales and we're going to be talking a little bit about Ariane. Press money. So there's an idea that's had a fair amount of traction over the years, which is that the economy of early medieval Wales was cashless. Um, people weren't using coins, uh, it was all barter or largesse or payment in kind. And one of the main reasons that this idea has taken hold is we don't have many coins from early medieval Wales. We have coins, but more on that in a second. So the idea here is that with the concept, uh, with the collapse of the Roman Empire, with the withdrawal of Roman troops from Britannia, from the island of Great Britain, the, and the Isle of Man, sorry Manxman, we found a watchtower, um, the use of Roman coinage obviously collapses alongside this withdrawal. And so people stop using coins, there's very little international trade happening, all those trading networks and road systems that the Romans set up have all gone. What do you need coins for? We need to survive, so it becomes a subsistence farming and warrior system. So the economy is based off, you know, can you feed yourself? Yes. Can you feed yourself and somebody else? Great. Can you feed yourself and give a portion of what you make on your farm to your local chieftain so that he can feed his warriors to defend us from the tribe down the road? Yes, fantastic. We have an economy. There's some of that that works, and I think there's some of it that doesn't quite work as well. One of the strange things about this is it implies that the island of Great Britain, the Britons on the island, were using coins. We have pre-Roman, uh, certainly pre-Roman occupation coinage from Great Britain. Then the Romans arrive, and then they leave, and everybody stops using coins for some reason coins no longer have any intrinsic value, which is interesting in itself. You sort of imagine places like the Weimar Republic, where money becomes ridiculous, where you're paying for things with a billion mark note, because your money is just worthless at that point. And people revert to a barter economy, because they're like, listen, money is a stupid thing. I can write, you can't write. How about I write a letter to your parents for you every day for the next six months in exchange for you, I don't know, whatever. Whatever it may be, repairing my boot. So <clears throat> that was a weird example, but there we go. So yeah, there's this concept that Wales doesn't have money in the sub-Roman and early medieval age. And the book that you want to read really for some depth on this um, well, there are a couple of books, but the one that I was reading recently in preparation for this video was Stevens's um, The Economy of Medieval Wales. It starts in the 11th century, but it does have some pre-11th century context to it and some very good reading, um, further reading and bibliographic material in it. So if you're looking for a place to start, I recommend that. It is an academic book, so it's a bit expensive uh, unless you buy it secondhand. He makes some really good points in his book. One of the excellent things that we need to remember is that this isn't a fully free society. We have enslaved people, we have serfdom, we have a nobility, and we have royalty and aristocracy. So this is not a republic, this is not a utopia. Um, this is certainly not a place where all men are equal, by any means, and certainly women are not equal legally to men. <clears throat> in let's call it King Arthur's Britain. People are aware of things like the fall of Rome and the withdrawal of Roman troops. People are aware of money. There are still Roman coins everywhere. Uh, they're aware of silver and gold and precious metals. 
they are aware of all of this stuff. They're aware of the value of things. Okay, so this isn't one of those weird Victorian fictions where the white man goes to some exotic place where they don't know the value of anything. Like, that's not how this works. People know that things are valuable. People know that things have an intrinsic value and that they need them. So you need a pair of shoes. You're not a shoemaker. How do you get a pair of shoes? You either use a system of coins that represents value, right? So you have silver coins or gold coins, or you have coins like we have now that are basically worthless, but they represent value, or you barter or you gift. So you need a new pair of shoes. Let's say your feudal lord sees that you need a new pair of shoes and says, here, serf, have a new pair of shoes that you can farm my land better for me. Thank you, my liege. Like, you'll pay me back by working my land anyway. The least I can do is give you a pair of shoes that will allow you to do that more efficiently. So that is a thing that could happen. Somebody else might see that you need something and say, well, listen, I'll give you a pair of shoes because it's the right thing to do. They might say, I'll give you a pair of shoes and in a few weeks time, <clears throat> you can help me plowing my field in exchange or something like that. But what does the evidence tell us? So the evidence tells us that Viking Age whales, that early medieval whales had money, that they were aware of money. We have Cyfraith Howell, the laws of Howell, Howell Va, Howell the Good, who was a king of the Hilbarth and effectively a king of most of Wales in the 10th century, who, the story goes, codified Welsh law. He codified Brythonic law and Cyfraith Howell basically became the basis for Welsh law until Cyfraith Howell is diddorol iawn, very interesting, because Cyfraith Howell has a lot of common sense stuff in it, where, you know, if somebody does something wrong to you, you have the right to compensation. Um, there's not very much punitive law in there. It's not, you know, if you, if you murder somebody, you will be hanged. It's an awful lot of, it is compensatory law. If you murder somebody, you pay their family, similar to the Weir Guild system in Anglo-Saxon England. And, the interesting thing about Cyfraith Howell is we have the the Gwerth, the value of an awful lot of things. So we have uh, the value of weapons, of tools, of livestock, of body parts in case you're injured. And all of these values are given in silver. Okay, so it will say um, Petair Ariant Arhikain. 24 silver. And when it says 24 silver, the Arian that they're talking about is Kenyoka, is pennies. So they use the Kenyog, the Kenyog Kvraith, the legal penny, or the Kenyog Kutta, or the Kenyog Gotta, whichever you prefer. And the Kenyog Gotta and the Kenyog Kvraith are different values. So the I think it's 24 grains. Editing Jimmy will put it up there for the legal penny and then a third of that for the short penny, I think, off the top of my head. Not only are they aware of money and coinage in early medieval Wales, in Viking Age Wales, they're using it in their legal system. The Kenyog, the penny, it is taken from Charlemagne. Charlemagne, when he becomes um, Emperor of the Franks, uh, Emperor of the Romans, I beg your pardon, and King of the Franks, uses the penny as a standard measurement. It's also the only silver penny that's being minted in Europe for a long time. Uh, you just have pennies. You have bits of pennies and you have more than one penny. 12 pennies make a shilling. 20 shillings makes a pound. And that's a European thing. It's not just a, a, a British English thing. And the pennyweight system is a really useful one because you can, it's, it gives you a standard. It gives you a literal silver standard that you can apply to any item that you want to value, right? Excuse me, just refocus myself. Um, which is great, which is very, very handy. What was I talking about? Pennies. So, the pennies have a set value as laid down by Charlemagne over in France. However, they also have a value in kind. So, uh, you can work out what a penny is worth. Uh, so, you can you can work out what something is worth in pennies, you can work out what a penny is worth, which means if you don't have any pennies, you can pay in kind. So we have things like the 
the sad heart of a king, where if you have to pay galannas, if you if you are, if you injure a king, if you insult a king, the sad heart, the insult value, the wear guild, is an very interesting measure. It's basically all of the cattle from a certain number of farms in your realm, uh, a rod of silver, the thickness of the king's thumb, and up to his chin when he sat down, so basically a rod of silver this high, this thick, uh, a plate the size of his face of silver, and a load of horses. <clears throat> That's not pennies, right? That's not pennies. That is a very abstract amount of money but it's also extremely useful that amount of raw silver you could mint into coins you could give as gifts you could make into jewelry uh, the cattle have obvious value in skins and milk and and uh, breeding and meat if you for example cut off somebody's ear but they don't lose their hearing you get ninepence uh, if you cut off uh, if you injure somebody's eye they get 24 pence that kind of thing and this is all based off the Charlemagne silver pennies weight and value. So everything has a fixed value, which is very, very useful. Because if everything has a fixed value in Kenyoka, in pennies, and you don't have a Kenyog to your name, you might have something else. So let's say you owe somebody, uh, a, let's say you owe somebody a penny. Well, I don't have a penny. I don't have any silver. I'm a subsistence farmer from deepest, darkest Dehibarth. You know, the, 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 I'm, my wages paid in grain that I make into, into broth and into bread, and a portion of that I give to the Achelor, to the noble who owns the land that I'm bound to as a bonded farmer. You are unfree, you're not, a, you're not slave, an enslaved person, you're not slavery, but you are bonded to this land. You have to basically ask permission to leave, unless you join the church and become a tonsured cleric, or you are raised up to one of the offices of court and you become effectively a minor noble. So, you owe somebody a penny. Why well, I'm got a penny? What do I what do I do? Well, let's take a look at the law. Let's go and ask the local Kavrithur, the local lawyer, if um what can I give this man instead of a penny? Well, the laws of Howell are very clear on the value of certain items. Do you have, for example, any eggs? No, I don't have any eggs. Uh I don't have any chickens, I don't have any birds at the minute. I could forage for eggs but so could he yes fair enough okay do you have a knife yes i have a knife that i'm not using at the moment it is a good knife it is in good repair it is sharp according to the law that is worth one penny do you accept a knife instead of a penny i could sell that knife for a penny to somebody else yeah absolutely i'll take a knife off him instead job done thank you very much lovely and that's the common sense aspect of kvraith howell for me is you are a subsistence farmer a surf a bonded worker of the land in early medieval Gwynedd. You're not carrying around much cash. Your life, your society is effectively cashless. If you live in probably a Maer Drev, uh, if you live in like one of the, the bigger towns, one of the administrative centres, maybe you have a different job where you do get paid in money. Maybe you're a scribe and you are paid partly in silver, partly in board and lodgings, and partly in new clothing or material. That's common sense. If people don't have money, but you still need to pay people, you need to figure out what stuff is worth. And it's really interesting to see what things are worth. Like a, a guard dog is worth nine pence. If your guard dog dies and it is within nine steps, of your door, it is a good dog, it is worth money. If your guard dog dies more than nine paces away from your door, it has deserted its post, it is a bad dog, and it is worthless and you don't get any money for it. But it's so interesting to see um, what the values of things are. So I've, I've, I've put the Middle Welsh text in the description of the video in case anybody's interested, it's, it's there and you can have a little look and it's interesting to root through cashless society. Was early medieval Wales a cashless society? Well, no, we have hoards. We have silver coin hoards from all over Wales, from North Wales, South Wales, and Mid Wales. They are mostly in coastal locations. So one interpretation is that these are Viking raiders who come ashore, bury a coin hoard, and then leave. Another interpretation is that these are a community's silver, which is buried to protect them from Viking raids. Either one of which I could get behind. The idea that 
coinage simply disappears, doesn't work. We found individual coin finds. We've got multiple coin finds from all over Wales, from all over Great Britain throughout the period. What we don't have is coins minted with the image of Welsh kings. So we do have coins. We've got one coin with Hoelvar on it, a single coin minted in Chester. Why is a coin being minted in Chester in England for a Welsh king? We don't know. Possibly it was uh, a sign of respect for Howell. Howell had a very good relationship with some of the kings of, of Wessex, with Athelstan. He was notoriously close to, to King Athelstan. We don't know why this coin has been minted for Howell. What it does tell us is that they were aware of coinage, and obviously Howell, King Howell, was aware of coinage. Obviously he was using coinage. There was trade with other countries, there was there was there was raiding there was looting there was treasure this stuff has value the fact that his laws put monetary value on things means that they were aware of the value of money and therefore it's not a cashless society even in as much as they're using cash as the basis of their as the basis of their um compensatory law Cash exists, cash, cash is in people's minds, they know about cash. You're getting paid in silver or in the equivalent value of silver. So it's not a cashless society as such, but in practice, most people are probably not using cash very much because they don't need to. They need bread and they need leather and they need cheese and they need water and beer and livestock. They don't need silver for very much. It's also worth remembering that there's not much urbanization in Wales. When the Normans turn up in England, they bring an awful lot of new concepts. Urbanization sort of rapidly grows from the 11th century across Great Britain, not just in England, uh, and also in, in Ireland as well. So by the time the Normans arrive, give it a couple of centuries and you have places like Cardiff, which is a large town and has a couple of thousand people living in it by the 1300s. You have things like Carnarvon uh, becomes a walled town, a, a city pretty much by the standards of the day. Um, you have markets and you have Norman style monetary exchange for goods and services instead of barter and payment in kind. Cyfraith Howell is still being used, don't get me wrong, Cyfraith Howell and the value set in it are still being used. So a lot of people, especially in uh, non-urban areas, are probably still doing this whole barter and exchange based off pennyweight values thing. But if you then go into town, it's harder to do that, especially if you're transient. If you're going into town with grain for the town and you say, right, here's a load of grain, what can you give me? Uh, well, I can give you money. Would you like some money? Then you can spend that money and bring stuff back to your farmstead and your small holding that the small holders and the farmsteaders need. And it's a complex, nuanced, situation. How far did you think we'd get into the video before I said nuance, right? Um, it's a nuanced situation. I'm not saying nobody was using cash. I'm not saying everybody was using cash. I'm not saying I'm right. This is a theory based off my reading, my research, and the archaeology that I have had contact with. You might have a completely different idea of how things worked, but we have a society which is feudal, or at least proto-feudal. We've got a legal system which is heavily based on the value in silver of items and people and parts of people and we've got a wider European situation where that silver penny weight is the basis of an economy that largely uses silver coins as its as its token of exchange. Bear in mind it was also perfectly reasonable in this period to use silver that wasn't a minted coin. So minted coins are great and if they are a genuine silver penny, fantastic, you know how much weight that is, you can also just chop a piece of silver and use that. Silver's silver, so as long as you have the right weight of silver to pay for something, you can use that, and it's called hack silver. So hack silver was a perfectly legitimate form of currency, a token of exchange for goods, of, goods and services. 
Definitely not a cashless society in the way that modern people might think of it, where nobody uses cash um, and the, the, the value, money value means nothing anymore. What is a pound? What is a dollar? What is a shilling? What is a euro? But money wasn't the only way of paying for things and cash money certainly wasn't the only way of paying for things. The way your economy basically works in medieval Wales, as far as we can tell, is fairly feudal in nature. You pay the people above you in grain, uh, the people above you might pay you in protection, military protection, in certain freedoms, certain services. If you are a member of the royal court, one of the 24 Swedokyon officers of the Hlis, of the court, you are paid in room and board and clothing and uh, also possibly some silver. Access to the king's silver, to the king's purse, is obviously highly privileged, but silver is needed, especially if you need to go somewhere else to buy goods in from a town, an urban area, where people use coins as the token of exchange for goods and services. But it's a nuanced situation. How long did you think we'd get into this video before I said nuanced? There are lots of different ways of paying people. It's a nuanced situation because it depends on the situation that you're in. If you're a farm, if you're a farmer, a subsistence farmer in rural Powys, you are in a very different situation to a cloth merchant living in late 12th century Cardiff by the port. Yeah, you are a soldier. You are a professional soldier working for the king of the Hilbarth. You are in a very different situation to a blacksmith working in the upper D Valley. You need different things, you pay for things with different things. So, do you pay with beer? Do you pay with silver? Do you pay with items that you have made? Do you pay with livestock? Do you pay with grain? Do you pay with coins? Do you pay with gold? It's a nuanced situation, but was early medieval Wales a cashless society? No, it wasn't a cashless society. It was simply a much more diversified portfolio of an economy than simply paying with silver. <laughs> so that was a bit of a rambly one, um, but I hope you enjoyed it. Jochen Vaur and Willio, thank you very much for watching. Um, thank you to all of my wonderful patrons. I've had a load of extra patrons this month. Hi everyone, thank you. Uh, if you want to support the channel financially, we have the Patreon, we have the coffee link in the description. So uh, yeah, Jochen Vaur Jan, thank you very much. And Tana Tronessa, till the next time. Who will Vaur? Bye bye.